Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the E3 podcast. I'm Melissa Johnson. I am excited to have today Robin Alexander with us. Um, she is doing really cool things with multifamily that we're going to talk about, some stuff that I have not heard of before. So I'm really excited to hear about that. Thank you, Robin, for coming on and talking with us. Thank you, Melissa. It's great to be here, and I'm very excited to share any information I can to help people. Awesome. So tell us a little bit about you. Tell us what you're up to. Oh my gosh. So um, I'm up in the New England area and uh, we do something called adaptive reuse and we also do value add in the apartment sector. So a lot of people don't know what adaptive reuse is. Um, that's when you take a building that was once built for a specific purpose and it's outlived that usefulness and then you convert it to another use. So in my particular case, I convert buildings into apartments. And then with the value add, uh, we will take existing apartment complexes and most of the time they need a lot of TLC and um, we come in, we renovate those, and then we reposition them for a much better valuation. So that's what we do. And it's fun. Not a lot of people do it. Uh, it's a lot of work, <laughs> but it's good. <laughs> Sounds like it. So I'm curious with the, um, so let's start with the, um, let's start with the apartment, the, the kind of rehabbing of the apartment sort of thing. Sure. That's really interesting. Um, do you so are you actually buying these apartment complexes that are kind of run down and need the fix up? Or are you doing that for other people that already own them? Or how does that work? It's our business to go in there and purchase properties. Um, we work specifically with the owners. Um, and we also will work uh, with brokers who bring us off market deals. Uh, these are not properties that you're likely to find in the MLS. Uh, these are properties that have been owned for 10, 15, 20 years. Maybe mom and pop have lived off of the revenue um, and the cash flow, and they didn't really put a lot back into the product. Um, and then we negotiate with them. We purchase the properties, and then over a 15-month period, we renovate them, depending on how big the uh, the complexes are. On the smaller ones, it will take about a year. And on the larger ones, it takes about 15 months because we have to be able to cycle through all of the leases. Mm, okay. So you've got to, are you, so they're staying in the place in the apartment. So y'all are renovating the vacant ones, I guess. And as people, their leases expire, then renovating sure. the rest the of those. The process is pretty simple. Melissa, what we do is we, the first thing we do is we renovate the common area because we want it to be curb appeal, curb ready, so that uh, we get new, when we get new tenants interested in moving in, they look at the, the overall property and say, wow, this is nice because it's got nice curb appeal. So, you know, we'll do the hallways, we'll make sure that the common areas, if there's laundry rooms, things like that, we make sure that the systems are up and running, meaning uh, the HVAC, plumbing, electrical, roofing, things like that. Um, so we do the, the common areas first, and then we do any vacancies, obviously. We will um, take any of the tenants at will, we'll give them a notice of non-renewal, and then we'll ask the tenants if they want to move into the newly renovated um, units. So we give them that option, or we uh, bring outside tenants in. It just depends. And then we cycle through that all the way through to the end of the 12 months, where we've got people that had signed leases just before we purchased the property. Now they have been given the notice of non-renewal and then we just go through the process there. So we're typically fully stabilized at about 15 months on larger projects. Oh, wow. So when these people, if they do opt to move into one of the renovated units, you're obviously raising the rents, right? Yeah, on them. We do, yeah. What does that look, is that like, is there a certain percentage that, that you're increasing the rents? It really just varies. If we have a property that's been owned by uh, like a mom and pop and they've been good about um, keeping the place up, but they haven't been good about raising rents because they've kept long-term ten tenants in there, um, you know, it's going to be a much higher increase than if it were just, you know, somebody that signed a lease a year ago, you know, we might be able to get another 150 to 200 bucks a month. Mm. It just depends. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So, um, with the with the complexes, 
are you are you holding them after you renovate them? Are you renovating, putting new tenants in place, and then selling the the whole complex? We do both. A lot of it has to do with the geography. If it's closer to home, we're going to keep it. Um, if the market's stronger, we're going to keep it. Um, if it's an area where it's more of an A plus, uh, we're typically going to sell it off to an investor that wants to have an A plus property. Okay. Can you explain what that what that means? I don't do multifamily, so I'm not sure oh. the terminology. <laughs> sure. So there's um, there's different market classes and there's different asset classes. So the market class that I'm referring to would be like the, uh, the metropolitan Boston area or the metropolitan Atlanta. So the bigger downtown areas, um, they typically will pay a lot more for a property that's stabilized. So we're more likely to sell in those markets than we would be in one of the smaller rural markets. So the downtown uh, metropolitan areas that are are big and popular, those are those are typically A or A plus markets. Mm -hmm. And then once you have a fully renovated project and you've got higher end finishes, that makes the the asset that you have also an A or an A plus. Okay, that makes sense. So the higher the higher the class, the higher the ticket. <laughs> Okay. Well, that's a great strategy. That's really smart too, moving those properties like that, because I'm sure they move a lot faster, right, than the other stuff that's not in those areas. They do. They do. Especially when you have a, a pretty good seller's market. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how many of these have you done so far? Oh my gosh. Way too many. I've been in this business. Um, I did my first fix and flip back in 1993. Um, and then I got into the commercial sector back in 2006. So a couple. So what, what brought you into the commercial section of things? You know, I noticed that um, the majority of the super uber wealthy people and the, the super wealthy families, um, most of them generated their wealth and their legacy wealth through real estate investing. So I kind of made it my mission to learn what they did so that I could go out and do it myself and then teach it to other people. Because I think if you have a specialized skill set and a specialized knowledge, I think you have an obligation to share that with other people. I agree. I love that. Thanks. I like that abundance mindset. I feel like some people, you know, they want to hold it so close. And I just think there's just so much more benefit in sharing what you're I doing. And I think there's enough for everybody out there, right? I totally agree with you, Melissa. Love that. So let's talk about the other side of things that you're doing. So taking these other commercial properties and turning them into converting those into apartments. What does that look like? Well, sure. So um, you could go to, I, I wouldn't recommend this downtown, you know, Boston or downtown San Francisco or anything like that. But if you go into the markets that are within commuting distance of those types of markets, you're going to notice that there's a lot of, um, you know, old, sad looking properties, uh, big commercial buildings. Um, for instance, in Manchester, New Hampshire, which is where I'm located, um, there was an old jewelry building and it was in the market. And I thought, hmm, I wonder what I could do with that. And attached to it was another building um, and they were shared by a common party wall and it was an old pool hall. Pool hall? Pool hall? And um, so I, that one wasn't in the market. And I thought, well, if I could get both of them together, that would give me about 60,000 square feet. And that's an awful lot of apartments that you can do. So I found out who the owner was of the property that was off market. I asked if he'd consider selling. Uh, he said, make me an offer. We put the deal together and we wound up closing both of them. So that one, uh, we're putting 33 residential units in and we're putting in five commercial spaces. And it's in the central business district of a downtown. Um, it's about 45 minutes from, uh, Man uh, sorry, it's about 45 minutes from Boston. And um, it's just, it's a really good way to repurpose sad, vacant, abandoned commercial buildings and, and you know, kind of start regentrifying an area with what's needed most, and that's housing. Yeah, you know, I was... Um... I was talking to somebody earlier on another podcast and we were talking about that lack of affordable housing right now. And so I think that's what you're doing is really super cool taking those places, and especially in those areas where there is a lot of gentrification going on. Like I know yeah. there's certain areas of San Antonio 
like a great example is um, we had the Pearl Brewery here and it was just this old brewery and it, I think it had been vacant and stuff for a really long time. It was in a great location though, like just north of downtown. Like, I mean, it's downtown, but just like right on the north edge of downtown. Mm -hmm. And um, several years ago, developer, I guess, bought it and started renovating the whole thing. And they did like a mixed use thing. So there's residential living there. You know, they took one of the buildings and made it into apartments. They took another one and actually put a culinary institute in there. Mm -hmm. They've got all these like really famous restaurants in there now. They turned one building into a hotel. So, mm -hmm. but I mean, this is like a dilapidated eyesore though for many, many years. So I think... That's just, that's really cool. I love, I love what you're doing with that. Thank you. It takes a little bit of vision and, and it takes a pretty decent team to be able to put the vision together. Um, and, it, and it doesn't have to be any specific type of a building. It's just one that would, that one that might lend itself well to apartments. And, you know, we've done school buildings, we've done office buildings. We've, um, we're looking at hotels right now. There's a lot of hotels that are either being auctioned off or have gone out of business because of the pandemic. Um, and hotels would be a perfect fit for an adaptive reuse for apartments because you've already got a lot of the plumbing and a lot of the, the infrastructure in there and so you can put in studios um you can put in one bedroom apartments and and um uh, it might be a really good fit so it, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily matter what type of building it was as long as you can see the vision um in in new hampshire there's a lot of mill buildings that you know what they used to be mill towns and many of them have been converted to um mixed use where it's partially uh apartments and partially uh, office buildings and stuff. So it's, it, there's a lot that you can do with it. Yeah. Have you thought about doing a mixed use development like that? Or are you strictly sticking to the apartment formula? I, I prefer the apartments myself, but um, one of the buildings that we're doing did have a mixed use and we had to keep, uh, because it was originally zoned for retail, we had to keep retail on the first floor and the front half of it, but we got a variance for the rear of the first floor to be able to put apartments down there. Oh. Um, so it, it's just a matter of working with the jurisdiction and, and, and going to them while you're under contract and say, look, this is kind of what I'm seeing, you know, the, the best and highest use for this would be this. What do you guys think? What, what would you, Mr. and Mrs. City, what would you like to see in this spot and then see if you can work with them. And the more you can work with them and give them what they ask for, um, it's gonna be way better um, for getting your approvals. And, and we usually wind up getting unanimous approvals on our change of use, on our conditional uses and on our, on our variances because That's we work cool. well with the cities. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because you're giving them what they want. So exactly. it just makes the process probably a lot smoother. You know, they're yeah. getting what they want and then you're not having a hassle getting, you know, permits and things like that. So that was and another question really, that I had. Like, do you have to rezone these buildings a lot uh, of times too, yeah. I guess? Yeah, sometimes you have to rezone them. Sometimes you have to get a change of use permit. Um, sometimes you have to get a conditional use permit, which is different. Uh, conditional use might be, um, this was originally meant to do retail on the first floor, but uh, we want to be able to put apartments on the first floor in the back. And so in this particular jurisdiction, they call that a change of use um, permit. So we, we got that um, a variant. So we, um, in New England, there's a lot of basements mm -hmm. and they're really, really big basements. And I didn't want to lose, you know, 20,000 square feet of usable space. So we said, what if we were to put a self storage, a public self storage unit down in the basement and put in a freight elevator and we had the rear access so we talked to the city and they gave us a variance to put a, um, a self storage facility in our basement. Wow. That's smart. And I hear storage is like awesome to get into. It's it really very, is. Um, easy it's to manage, count. I think. <laughs> yep. That's so cool. So, um, what have you, like, what's your favorite project that you've done so far? Oh man. That's a, that's a tough. I feel like there's so many areas that you can be creative with this. 
There really are. And I, I think my most favorite one is the one that's completing in the moment. <laughs> because that, that, means, that means it gives me more working capital to go on to the next project. Um, but they're, they're all different. It's like, it's like saying, which one's your favorite kid? It's, you can't, right? <laughs> oh, can you? No, I'm kidding. My kids would kill me. <laughs> they all know the boy's the favorite. <laughs> there you go. It's a joke around here. That's funny. So tell me about um, what kind of a team do you have in place in order to do all these things? Because I'm sure that is just a massive undertaking. I can't even imagine what that would require. It is. And for a long time, I did it by myself. Um, and then I realized that the only way to, to break through the plateau to the next level of productivity is to hire people. Um, so I went to the people that I know and, and love and the people that I trust and people I've worked with before. Um, and I, I built a, a small team that has very um, differing skill sets. And so it really works well because we, we complement each other from the standpoint that this one does really well with paperwork and organization. This one does really well with the finance and the paperwork on that. This one over here has more of the vision. This one over here has the detail portion of it. Um, so it, it works out really well from that perspective. And then additionally, we have what we call the away team. Uh, so we're the home team, they're the away team, and that would be the architects, the, um, the site surveyors, the uh, mechanical engineers, the uh, contractors. So it, it takes a small village to build a village. So yeah. um, it's just a matter of getting the right group of people together and making sure that you can work with them. And I've, I've probably made every mistake that there is to make. <laughs> um, and hopefully I'm, hopefully I'm done making mistakes, but I, I doubt it. <laughs> We're never done. I just made a huge one last year myself. So oh, <laughs> I'm like, how did I do that? It's been 18 years. I know better. <laughs> it, it happens, right? Yeah. Do you use the same people uh, for each project or do you start from scratch with each one? If it's in, a, in it, if it's in an area that I've already worked in and, and we've worked well together, I keep the same team together. Um, if I'm going into an area, so we're, we're looking at a huge portfolio. Um, it's, it's a value add portfolio in Rhode Island. Um, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And that, that's a pretty significant drive for us. It's about a half, uh, an hour and a half. Um, and that's not something I'd want to be doing every day. So we're in the process of vetting out a, an away team from that perspective where we have somebody that can be a project manager on site all day, every day that's responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the renovations. Um, obviously we go down and, and take a look at it every week or every other week. Um, but we, we have to have teams in place for areas that are geographically less desirable, meaning the travel to them is, is less convenient. Hmm. So, and then you had mentioned, so with, with, with the apartments, you had mentioned that you're buying those from, you know, the direct from the sellers. Are you doing, how are you purchasing the, these other properties? Are they from the MLS? Or are you searching and like finding the owners and, and searching them out too the same way? A lot of times, Melissa, we're just driving around and we see a, a dilapidated building or we see, um, you know, maybe there's a for sale sign on, on one of these commercial spaces. And if it catches our eye from a standpoint that, hey, that could be a really nice living space, um, you know, we'll pursue it. Um, if it doesn't have a for sale sign on it or there's no nothing other than the address on it, then we do some research, skip tracing, find out who owns it. Um, and then we just reach out manually from that perspective and, and see if they'd be willing to sell. And if it's vacant or abandoned or, you know, looks really bad, most of the time they're receptive to talk to you. And we, we get some really good deals. I mean, you know, we typically buy somewhere around the $30 per square foot. Nice. So it's which like it, driving is, for driving for commercial, driving for vacant buildings, right? Instead of driving for dollars. Yeah, I call them driving for dollars. <laughs> I guess it is still driving for dollars, right? It's just, you're looking for something different. You know, that's, so that's what I do a lot too, is just, um, I primarily market and buy from direct from sellers. Yep. So it's the same, it's like the hunt, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's finding these properties. Do you have any specific um, criteria that you're looking for when you're looking for these places? 
You know, it just depends when it when it comes to working with the brokers, because I have a handful of brokers that bring me off market deals, truly off market, meaning that they're not going to anybody else. Um, oftentimes they'll come to me first and say, hey, and that's how I get the uh, Rhode Island portfolio, um, because they know that you have a good relationship and you can take care of it. <clears throat> and um, they 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 want to be able to close the deal with you. So when I speak with the brokers, I tell them exactly what I'm looking for. And I tell them, hey, you know what, I'm looking for vacant buildings that, you know, are large enough to be able to house at least 20 apartments. Because if, if I can't do 20 apartments, it's it's most likely not going to be worth the while. Mm -hmm. It depends on what structural has to be changed. Um, it, it depends on the bones of, of the um, the abandoned property. Um, when it comes to the portfolios, I, I tell the, um, the brokers, hey, I'm looking for value add opportunities. I'm looking for multifamily apartments. I'm looking for um, stuff that's not necessarily in uh, an A plus market, but I'm looking at a B market. And B markets are typically pretty easily commutable to the A markets. Okay. So, um how are you funding these deals? Are you using private money? Are you getting loans? Are you using your own money, lines of credit, investors? All of the above. <laughs> All of the above. <laughs> so, so typically um, what we do is I, I put a lot of money into it myself. Um, we also do uh, something called equity partners. That's where we will take an individual who has excess capital that they want their excess capital to be making more money um, and they'll come in and they'll partner with us. Um, we also put debt on a property. Um, we will do a syndication. Uh, we've done several syndications, both uh, 506B and 506C. Um, it, it really just depends. Um, we, we, sometimes we have to cobble it together and sometimes we already have everything lined up ahead of time. Um, the, the portfolio down in Rhode Island, um, it has a $7.7 .7 million loan on it, and we would have to assume it because there's a yield maintenance fee on it that, that's a couple of million bucks. So that's another way. Uh, that's sort of seller financing, but not exactly. It's just you have to assume the loan. So that means that we have to come in with the extra, you know, 4 or $5 million. So you're raising money to do that too, I guess, pulling that yep. from other sources too. Yep. Awesome. Well, this has been really, really interesting to me. <laughs> I feel like I want to go drive around and find, we have all these buildings here that are just so run down. And, and I think yeah. you're right on with like just the way things are right now, the economy and stuff. Go, like there's so many vacant buildings after COVID, so many buildings, businesses went under and these properties yeah. are just sitting here. Yep. And, and what a great a way. Yeah. What a great way to add value and, and, and help people too, I think. Thank you. I mean, we, we, we think that housing is, is a necessity, not a luxury. So we build, you know, safe, well-designed properties that people can live in and take pride in. And, they, and we provide a, an affordable space for them to do it. And, you know, it's, it's, I think it's community centric and, and when you do the right thing with the community, the right things happen. Yeah, for sure. I imagine you probably have somebody managing all these properties for you too, right? That's we do. So yeah. Much. yeah. <laughs> do you use a property management company? Do they manage, like, do you have one company that manage everything or do mm -hmm. you have that kind of spread out between depending on where it's at? It's spread out depending on where it's at. Um, during, during the uh, value add, process we personally manage it and we do that because it allows us to understand um, the makeup of the tenants that are in there it allows us to get to know the building super well um, and it, it just really allows us to really stay in touch with the numbers um, as soon as we get it stabilized if we keep it we hire a professional property management company that's local to the property um, and if we don't keep it obviously it, it's not an issue <laughs> Okay. We, we just sell it and then they bring on whatever they want to do for property management. So um, I meant to ask you this earlier because we talked about it, but how has COVID and everything that's happened over this past year, how has that affected what you're doing? 
You know, it's been a crapshoot in some t in some places, and it's been a godsend in others. Um, sometimes, so we oftentimes will use um, what they call alternative financing or bridge financing, um, and that that was really impacted during the height of the pandemic from March till about January. A lot of the lenders were crabbing back their offers, and and we had had some approved offers um, in the multi millions, and they wound up crabbing them back, going, "No, oh, well, we kind of changed our mind because they didn't know what was going to be happening with the, you know, trillions and trillions that were being stimulated into the economy. Um, we we've, we've seen huge cost increase in the materials from from sheet goods right down to the lumber and, and the fixtures. It's, it's just been crazy. Um, but it's also allowed us to really look at our business and streamline a lot more of it that we hadn't been doing just because we didn't have time to do it. Mm, very true. I think a lot of people went through that process. A lot of business owners, I know I did too. Mm -hmm. It just, it really forces you to take a look at your business and see those inefficiencies, especially yeah. when, you know, prices are going up and people aren't paying their rent. I don't know if you experienced that or not. I did, you know, yeah, a couple I, of tenants. I, yeah, we, we've had a couple of those. Um, we proactively did some research to find out what assistance would be available for the tenants at a state level. Um, and then we provided a write-up on that to all of our tenants so that they had the ability to go seek relief um, where they didn't know about it. And so we kind of handheld them through the process and knock wood so far, we're, we've only got two tenants that are still problematic. Wow. Out of how many units? A bunch. <laughs> <laughs> it's, less than, it's less than 1%. So we're, wow. we're happy. Wow. That's crazy. That's really good. And I, I like that you did that. That's what, that was actually really smart. I kind of wish I'd have done that now. I didn't think about it. You still can, because even if you have um, tenants that are in arrears, not just on, um, not just on their um, rent, but also in their utilities. So you, there's, there, are state, um, there are state funds that have been funded by the trillions and trillions of dollars um, that are specifically designed to help uh, tenants. So they may, not, they may have a job right now, but they may be six months behind in their rent. So you can still go through and find out which ones, which, first of all, what programs are available in your area. And then you can also uh, go through and, and provide that information to your tenants because your tenants are scared and, and oftentimes they think they don't qualify. And, and if you proactively help them, ultimately you're helping them, which helps you. Right. I like that. That's a really good idea. And that's a really great way to provide a value add for your yeah. tenants, you know, just like we do with anything else, this is something that you can do to inspire loyalty in them, you know, because they're going to want to stay. Now you help them and they're able to pay their rent and their utilities. So I think that's really smart. I think that's a Thanks. good I think it takes nugget. some of the stress off of them and it, it, it really does come down to the community. What are, what are we doing to be able to help the community? Because yeah, I mean, we, we are for profit. Um, and if we can solve problems and there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to, to make money off of it, right? Mm -hmm. but, but we're also doing it from a community centric position. That's awesome. Thanks. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Is there a, a way that people can get in touch with you if they want to learn more about what you're doing? Um, sure, they can. They could, um, I guess they could give me a call. Should I tell them what my number is? Yeah, you can say the number and then I'll put it, we'll make sure we put it in the show notes sure. for them too. So even though I live in New Hampshire, I have a California number because I lived in California for 30 years. Um, it's 760-803-2801. And honestly, just texting me a quick message is the best way. Hey, Robin, I heard you on the E3 podcast. Um, can we chat? Awesome. And is there, you have any, um, do you have any courses or any coaching that you're offering in this area too for people? Thank you. Um, so I do offer mentorship and coaching. 
um, and I have different levels of programs from once a week to twice a week to three to uh, four times a month. Um, I also do consulting. I have uh, a company that's hired me to help them do a master planned community um, of almost a thousand doors. Um, and it's not just residential, it's also hotel and retail. So it's pretty fun and that's, that's been moving along quite well. Um, so I'm available to help people um, from an entrepreneurship. Are you, are you trying to create a business, real estate or otherwise? And, and how do you do that? Um, I also help people learn how to do what I do and how I do it. Um, I'm a syndicator, so uh, we're always looking for uh, investors that want to get a really good return. Um, and uh, I also I also coach people in wealth building. So there's a lot of things that we can do to help. And I have several other coaches that help as well. Nice. And I've done that since 2006. <laughs> You've got a lot of experience and a lot to share. So if anyone's interested in that, definitely reach out to, to Robin and, and learn yeah, more text, about that. Texting is good or leaving me a voicemail message is great. Great. Well, thank you so much again. I appreciate all of your knowledge and sharing everything and got my little brain turning a little bit thinking about that maybe. So I might be texting or calling you too to talk more about some of this um, redevelopment stuff. That's really interesting. You are more than welcome to Melissa. Thank you so much for having me on the, on the podcast. Thank you.